Hello, friends, and welcome to the 3ABN Worship Center for another Dare to Dream sermon. I tell you, if you were here to receive the last one, you know that Pastor Corey Jackson is a man anointed of God to proclaim the gospel, the unashamed gospel of Jesus Christ. We talked about blind Bartimaeus, how the Lord can take a person from rags to riches. And tonight, the message is entitled, Give It One More Shot. So we encourage you to stay by for this Bible-filled, Spirit-filled message that we know will reach into your heart and bring you to the place that the Lord wants you to be. And we know that God is going to bless. Pastor Corey Jackson is from Chicago, Illinois, the very state uh, that 3ABN shares. They are far north, we are far south, but the Lord has brought the north and the south together tonight. He presently is the pastor of the Burns Seventh-day Adventist Church in Detroit, Michigan. He's been pastoring 14 years. The Lord has really reached into this young man's life and transformed him. He's a student of Black Hills uh, Evangelistic School. The Lord saw him going in the wrong direction, turned him around, and led him in the right direction. He has three children. He's known internationally as he's been invited around the world to share the gospel of the Lord. And he said last night in a wonderful way, he was studying to be a black Muslim and a black panther, but he ended up being a black pastor. Can we say amen to that? And so God really anointed his life. Tonight, once more, the message is entitled, Give It One More Shot. Stay tuned for the blessings of the Lord. We have a young man that amazed me when I heard his voice. I looked at his frame, and I wondered where that voice was coming from. Uh, Louis Claire, who is from Nassau, Bahamas, uh, 3ABN had an opportunity to meet him a number of years ago. Not too many years ago. He's only, he's only 22, and he sang while they were there. Tonight, he's going to bless us with a song entitled, He Will Carry You. And right after the singing evangelist, the next voice that you will hear will be that of Pastor Corey Jackson. There is no problem too big, God cannot solve it. There is no mountain too tall, He cannot move it. There is no storm too dark, God cannot calm it. There is no sorrow too deep, he cannot soothe it. For if he carried the weight of the world upon his shoulders, then I know, my brother, that he will care. shoulders then I know my sister that he will carry you he said come unto me all who are weary and I
that He will carry you. I know my brother and I know my sister. Amen. Amen. Do you believe he'll carry you through? Yes. Brother Louis, thank you. And uh, it's good to see you all today. I'm still amazed when young Louis sings. I don't know about you, but it, to see all of that come out of that little bitty young man. You know, you see him in the green room. He's a, a different guy. He's listening to his headphones. No more 22-year-old young man. But when he comes out, Lord have mercy, I'm just in awe, so I am thankful to hear him uh, sing. He'll carry you through. I am a perfect witness of that. He has carried me a mighty long way, and he has carried many of you the same. Let us begin with a word of prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, we come once again thanking you for the gift of salvation, thanking you for Jesus, the Christ, leading us, guiding us, and directing us along the way. As we meet together again, we just ask for your presence. We ask for your Holy Spirit to fill this place, fill every home that is listening, and that every heart shall be touched as words come from on high. So, Lord, hide me behind your cross and allow the word to be spoken in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Welcome to another edition of Foundations of Our Faith. I am enjoying my time here, uh, and I am glad to be here um, as we talk about Foundations of Faith. Understanding from yesterday that uh, we just have to learn how to what? Call on the Lord and call, and he gives us the help we need. And so just to uh, simply review a couple of things that we talked about yesterday. The call, five things we learned yesterday. Number one, we need to understand our condition. Understand the condition that we are in. Number two, we need to understand that others will try to quiet the call when we're trying to make changes for Jesus. And Number three, we must understand that when there are those who are, when we're crying, that someone will try to stop us, but we must learn to cry just a little bit louder. Number four, there are three things that we must do once Jesus Christ has, we have, he has our attention. Number one, we must change our garments. In other words, take off this self-righteousness. Uh, number two, we must change our position from sitting to rising up. And number three, we must come close to the Savior. We cannot live the same way and expect a different result. And the fifth thing is that Jesus will give us more than what we ask for. All the blind man asked for was to see. And Christ gave him not only his sight physically, but spiritually. And next thing you know, he, was, he went from begging to being in the way, being a follower of Christ, rags to riches. And so, as we talk today, give it one more shot. Our scripture for our foundation, just two of them, Ezekiel 36, 26, that simply says that God will give us a new heart and a new spirit. I like that. He will give us a new heart and a new spirit, a new way to think. Uh, and so I am looking forward to that continually. And also, Rome, excuse me, 12 verse 2, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so we spend time discussing the need to be transformed as we're talking about character development. And why is it? Because in volume 5, page 310, Ellen White says this, for if the thoughts are wrong, the feelings are wrong, 
Thoughts and feelings combined make up more character. And so we have to understand that if our thoughts are wrong, our feelings about things would be wrong, not just about people, but also about life. Uh, this morning, I was reading, and I noticed that some young man went to the theater in Louisiana and shot up the theater. And his family said he's been mentally ill for a long time. His thoughts have been messed up to the point where it propelled him to go to a place where people are just being entertained and decide he's going to kill people. We have to take, sense, take seriously how we, th- how we think, what we think about, because that, that thing leads to how we feel. Second uh, volume, Mind, Character, Personality says that transformation begins with our thoughts. Transformation begins with our thoughts. And the challenge we often face with our thoughts is this. No one can see our thoughts but God. And so we can look, to, we can look the part, dress up, and all that good stuff. And as folk are walking by, you can have some of the meanest things to say about them while smiling at them. And so we have to be very careful. And, and I understand that we are in these last days, but, but there's a reason why this thing for me has become important because I came across a statement a long time ago in Christ's Object Lessons when the, when the prophet says, when the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced, not almost, not somewhat, but perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to reclaim them as his own. So God is waiting for his folk to just look like him, to be twins, if you want to call it that. God is waiting for his character to be in his church and his people. And so I have taken the liberty everywhere I find myself going to spend time talking about character, spend time discussing thoughts. And so tonight, today, excuse me, we are going into another segment. If you go with me to Jeremiah chapter 29, as we start our, our three legs tonight, we talk about teaching, preaching, and healing that Jesus did in Matthew 4. So the first segment of this, we deal with teaching. Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah, the 29th chapter. Jeremiah is in the Old Testament. Give it one more shot. And there are so many Bible verses that I like, but I, I really love this one. Jeremiah 29. Uh, verse 11, the Bible says it this way, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace. Now, now I can just stop right there and just, I can just preach that thing right there. But I, I, I won't tonight, to, right now. But, but I, I can just stop right there and, and, and just preach how God thinks nothing but the best of us. You know, when others think the, the worst of us, when others talk about us, God's not doing that. He says, my thoughts of you are of peace. Peace is the absence of war or the absence of conflict. So, so, so that thing gets me excited, as you can see, because I love the way that God thinks of me. He said, thoughts of peace and not of evil. Not something bad, not something wrong, not something that's going to hurt you. The thoughts that I have of you, even if I'm going this way, God says it's still a peace. Even if I'm being disobedient, it's still thoughts of peace. God says I can't do nothing but think thoughts of goodness of you and not of evil. And to give you an expected end or a future and a hope. The Bible continues to say, then you shall call upon me and you shall go and pray unto me and I will hearken unto you promises, and you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. We're going to spend some time talking about that. When you, you shall find me. It's not that God himself is playing a game that I used to love when I was a little boy called hide and seek. God is not hiding from us, but Isaiah 59 says that our sins have separated us from our God. And so verse 14 says, and I will be found of you, saith the Lord. And I will turn away your captivity. So God promises some things that we can hone in on. Number one, he promises that he doesn't think anything negative of us. So if anyone out there thinks that God thinks wrong of you, you have the wrong God that you're looking at. The God that I know, he doesn't think anything evil of me. Deuteronomy chapter 4, he also says that in that, that you will find me when you give all you got. Deuteronomy chapter 4. 
Deuteronomy chapter 4, Old Testament, fifth Old Testament, fifth book of the Bible, Deuteronomy chapter 4. Looking at verse 29, Deuteronomy chapter 4, looking at verse 29, doing a little teaching right now. Deuteronomy 4 verse 29 says this, but if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him, if, if thou shalt seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. So in other words, when it comes to God, he expects all of us to give all we got. And we're going to see a story that exemplifies this thing tonight. Everything we got. You know, I, I'm an athlete by nature. Even though you look at this wide frame now, it doesn't look as though I'm an athlete. I'm, I'm an athlete in retirement while eating too much. <laughs> but nonetheless, I'm still an athlete. I have a 15-year-old son who thinks that no matter how old I get or how wide I begin to get, he still thinks that he can beat me in basketball. And so once a week, we have to, have to prove the point that I can still take him, even though it's a struggle to do it, because he has energy that I just don't possess at this moment in my life. When we plan together, I have to give it all that I got. If I at any point give just a little bit, not a lot, he takes advantage of it, and he runs me around the gym. But because I know that if I allow him to win at any moment, he's going to hold that thing over my head for the rest of my life in front of the church members, in front of family and friends, and I just can't do it. So what I have to do is give it all I got. And even when I get done, and I'm like, whew, I still have to give it all I got because if I don't, I will not come out victorious. Same thing with Christ. We have to give it all we got, no matter what shape we're in, no matter how tired we get. We have to give it all we got. In order to do that, 1 Timothy chapter 6, 1 Timothy chapter 6, 1 Timothy chapter 6 gives me my marching orders. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12 gives me my marching order. God says that you can find me when you give me all of you. But in order to do that, verse 12 says that I must fight the good fight of faith. To find and to be a part of Christ, it takes fighting. It's not something that you can just lay down and think it's going to be like the easing, easing on down the road like the way. It's not going to happen that way. We have to fight to stay faithful. We have to fight from the moment we get up. To the time we go to sleep, we have to fight this good fight of faith. And what's before me, the Bible says, lay hold on eternal life. See, I like to think that one day soon we're going to live forever. You know, when I was a young boy getting up, I can get up out my bed and run. And now as I'm getting older, 44, you may not think that's old, but as I get older now, I got to stretch a little bit before I move and, and do some turns here and there so that my bones can warm up, but, but one day soon, I don't have to worry about stretching anymore and doing some, some, some leg raises and getting all ready. Why? Because when eternal life is given, guess what? I get a new body. But we got to fight until then. The good fight of faith. This thing is a fight, y'all. It's not something that's easy. We must fight to stay faithful, fight to stay in, and fight not to give up. Why? Because eternal life is right there. And in order to fight Matthew 24, Matthew the 24th chapter, Matthew the 24th chapter, verse 13. So the Bible says, one, that when we search with all our heart, we will find him. Timothy tells us that we have to fight the good fight of faith when given all our heart. And Matthew 24, 13 says, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Not only do you need to fight, this thing takes endurance. This race many times is not to the swift, but the one who can endure, the one who can pace himself or herself. This thing is not a race. As I spoke to you about my 15-year-old son, I'm Isaiah, 
See, what he don't realize right now, because he don't have the wisdom I have, if he would just keep me running steadily, he would beat me because my endurance is low. He doesn't know that. I won't let him see it because if I do, then he'll take advantage of me. Well, he may see it now. I didn't just gave myself up, but, but hey, hey, hey. But I'm in the moment, so forgive the young preacher. All right, so, so if he just realized that my endurance is not as, 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 as long as his, and if he just keep dribbling that ball, keep running around, I may just have to grab him and hold him and, and just like a boxer just hold on to him for a minute. But, but, but in this race, it takes endurance. You have to pace yourself. So in my pacing to beat him, I don't try to shake him and, and take him to the hole. I just simply bag him down with this big body. Yeah. And then I turn around and shoot it. Yeah. That's all I do. And it preserves my energy. Yeah. So that in the end, he's more tired than I am. Because I have 100 pounds on him at least. So I know he can't take this big body, taking him down low each and every time. And so I take out his endurance before he take out mine. And the same way with the enemy, he'll try to take out your endurance before anything else. Because he knows once you get tired, you're ready to quit. You're ready to give up. You're ready to throw in the towel. But the Bible says keep fighting. The Bible says blessed is he who endures until the end. And so this is the job that we must face. This is what we must do. So let's see a picture of all four of these scriptures wrapped up in one. Let's see a picture of this taking place where a person is given all they have. A person is fighting the good fight, and a person is enduring. Go with me to Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. I I enjoy the book of Mark because for me, just me personally, the book of Mark is a book in which salvation is seen, both man and woman, and children. And so, as we look at Mark chapter 5, the first 20 verses deal with a man who's a demoniac, who's out of his mind, suicidal, if you may. The disciples touch shore. This man starts growling, and, and the disciples, even though they're with Jesus and just survived the storm in chapter 4, and he said, peace be still. As soon as they see this man, they start running. And Jesus deals with this man who is cutting himself and no man can tame. And, and the Bible says that he comes into his right mind and, and wants to go with Jesus. But Jesus says, no, go back home and tell your friends the good things God has done. And, and our story takes us to verse 21. And the Bible says, and when Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him and he was near unto the sea again. Yesterday we spoke about there are always a lot of people following Jesus. A lot of people always thronging about him. And that could be you and I, if we're not careful, just simply following and not giving in to the Savior. Verse 22 says, And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet and besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lies at at the point of death, I pray thee, come and lay hands on her that she may be healed and she shall live. Now, now here's Jairus, ruler of the synagogue, coming to the Savior there at Levi Matthew's house. And, and, and Jesus gets up instantly. The disciples, according to the Zion of Ages, are kind of stunned that Jesus would deal with this arrogant leader. And, and, and they see that he gets up at, at once. And, 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 and Jesus, to me, you know, I love Jesus, but Jesus is just cool. Jesus is a cool brother, cool savior. He's just cool. You know, he, nothing gets under his skin. He's, as he's moving, Desire of Ages says, he stops along the way and he heals some who are brokenhearted and he heals some who are troubled and he heals some who are sick. And, and, and even though he knows the end from the beginning, he knows what he can do. Jairus just has not figured that thing out yet. So he's wondering why is this Jesus taking his time when, when my daughter is losing it? And, and Jesus just taking his time, stopping here, healing somebody, stopping here, He'll helping somebody, and, and, and Jairus gets frantic, but, but along the way, the, the, the story seems to take a little turn to, to bring in another character in the scene of things. 
And verse 25 says, And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood for 12 years, a woman has a problem 12 years with an issue of blood. Yesterday we talked about the man, Bartimaeus, who was blind, couldn't see. Economic status must be poor. He was begging, and he was on the outside. Now we have a woman who is, has an issue, a malady, a problem. And sometimes, brothers and sisters, it's not enough to just call upon Christ. There's something more we need to do. And, and, and I love math, and, and so if you would just uh, be with me for a moment, 12 years is a long time. 12 years is 144 months. 12 years is 626 weeks. 12 years is 4,338 days. 12 years is 6,311,385 minutes. Long time. 12 years is 378,683,112 seconds. 12 years is a long time to have a problem. It's not anything short at all. I thought it was long before I can graduate school, but it was 12 years that this woman is dealing with one issue. Can you imagine having one problem that's lasting 12 years? Can you imagine the psychological thought? Can you imagine the frustration that takes place? Can you imagine what goes through a person's head that they're dealing with something for 12 long years? What I try to do, wherever I go, is try to humanize this thing so we can, we can, we can, both, we can all understand and apply it to our lives. Twelve years. See, I'm walking on stage today because for 12 years I dealt with two injuries on my big toe. Because I told you I was an athlete, played basketball in college, and ran track across the country. I know I don't look like it. Don't, don't judge me. But when you become an athlete and you play basketball as much as I did in high school and, and a little bit in college and, and even when I got grown and, and older and, and people step on your toes, your big toe. And when you're younger, you don't tend to think that you need to ice it. You think you're invincible. You think everything is, is just all right. And, and so I, I felt the same way. I, I didn't think one day that I'll get old and, 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 and a famous word called arthritis begin kicking in. So, so one day I could not uh, bend my toes. You know, most people walk and your toes bend. My, my toes just stood still. Now, I, I didn't pay it too much of mind. I just kept walking and I figured, hey, it's part of getting old. No one gave me a book on what old feels like or looks like. So I just figured it's part of the package. And so for 12 years, I am dealing with this, this, these toes. Not one toe, two big toes. And then I would... When I started preaching more and, and, and being more engaged, I, I would get home and them two big things would just ache. And I finally went to the doctor and the doctor said, you in trouble right now. Because the way they were growing with the arthritis on it, they were starting to turn. So I understand what 12 years feels like. I understand what pain feels like. I understand what discouragement feels like. But this woman has an issue of blood for 12 long years. And verse 26 says this, and had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was nothing better, but, but rather grew worse. Now, 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 listen to me now. Help me understand something. It, it's one thing to have good medical insurance. It's a whole other thing when you have to take it from your own pocket. It's a whole other ball game when you take out money not just from your savings and your checkings, but perhaps even your IRA or your, your, your retirement fund. And, and, and you go to different doctors who supposedly specialize in helping your situation, and, and you find out that in each situation you're getting worse and worse and worse. 
Uh, imagine the psychological drama that's taking place. You know, you get excited when you hear about this physician specializes in this. And, and so you go and you spend and you're like, oh, ma'am, I can't help you. And you, you, well, I can refer you to Dr. So-and-so. Then you go to Dr. So-and-so and, and, and you feel as though this one can do it. So you shell out some more cash and, and he says, ma'am, I'm sorry, I just can't help. How about you try Dr. Such-and-such over there? And then you go to Dr. Such-and-such and you go all the way over here. And by the time you get to your last doctor, and the doctor tells you, ma'am, there's nothing more anybody can do. You are flat broke. And not only that, you spend all this time going to these different doctors and you find yourself getting worse. So you've been dealing with something for 12 years. You're now broke. Medicare, Medicaid is not going to kick in. You're broke. And the people who specializes in this thing tells you there's nothing you can do. Nothing they can do, excuse me. Can you imagine feeling rejected, discouraged, and all these things? Can you really imagine how this woman is really feeling? Let me try to give you as close to understanding this as I can. I tend to get personal and transparent. I have a mother that I love to death who is going on 70 years old. And at age 12, interesting, 12 years, Jared's daughter, she contracted polio in Rose Hill, Mississippi, took the, the vaccination for polio and still contracted polio. And, and there's no cure for polio. And as she's gotten older, she's gotten worse. We just had a stint of being in the hospital for three days a couple months ago, and, and I see the, the, re, the, the dejection on her face. And no matter how many doctors I've taken her to, no matter how many people say, is this problem, is that problem, we've done natural stuff, we've done medical stuff, we've done awesome, like almost everything. And it just does not seem to work. And this last stint... Or been in the hospital, she looked at me. She said, son, I'm tired. Now, my mother, I've had her with me since 2002. It's 2015. For 13 years, you can say I've been the parent now, taking care of my mother. Because it's interesting. They take care of us, and then we take care of them. And for me, it's hard watching this bulwark of a woman who raised me by herself, only this tall, and her, her fist is this big, because when she punch you, she'll knock you clear out. <laughs> uh, she can hit so hard, I didn't think my mother had it in her. I thought Superman and Wonder Woman was just a Marvel comic, but it was tr real life in my home. Yes, but I'm watching this bulwark of a woman now get feeble and feeble. And this last thing in the hospital, and the doctors was talking about, in the case of resuscitation, do we have your permission? My mother said no. So as the son, listening to this, I started crying. And I did when I said, Mama, what, you, what did you say? She said, I said no. She said, I'm tired. I get up every day and my back hurts. I get up every day, my legs hurt. I get up every day. My internal organs are hurting, and I'm tired right now. I've been through this to this doctor and that doctor. I've done this. I've done that, and and situation is not getting better. So I'm, I said, I said, Mr. Doctor, can you step out a minute before you? <laughs> put this on a chart. I said, Mama, have you lost your mind? I said, Mama, I'd rather have you sore than not have you at all. She said, son, you're, you're not living this life. You don't know how painful this thing gets. You don't feel what I'm feeling. And so here I am. Whoo, so sometimes when I think about it, it's still fresh. It, <clears throat> it gets to me. I couldn't even imagine the thought of not having my mother around. But I can understand, I can empathize with her because I watch her pain. 
I watch what she goes through. I'm right there when she can't put certain things on. I have to help put her clothes on or help her reach places she can't reach. I'm right there. And so I can imagine this woman, y'all, listen to me now, has been going through this for 12 long years and, and nothing has gotten better. It has gotten worse. And not only that, listen to me now, not only that, but she missed Christ when he was in Capernaum teaching. She went to go see Christ and she missed him. And not only that, but then she missed him when she heard that he was at Levi Matthew's house. She got there too late. So imagine 12 years, this issue. Then you missed the Savior twice. Imagine the psychological effect that you're going through. On top of that, go to Leviticus 15 for a moment. Leviticus 15. Now she has to deal with this. Leviticus 15. Leviticus, the 15th chapter. Leviticus 15, verse 19, more particular. Leviticus 15, verse 19, the Bible says this. If a woman have an issue, and her issue in her flesh be blood, she shall be put apart seven days. And whosoever toucheth her shall be unclean until the evening. And everything that she lieth upon in her separation shall be unclean. Everything also that she sitteth upon shall be unclean. Going down to verse 25, the Bible says, And if a woman have an issue of her blood many days out of the time of her separation, or if it run beyond the time of her separation, all the days of her, the issue of her uncleanness shall be as the days of her separation, she shall be unclean. Every bed wherein she lieth, all the days of her issue shall be unto us the bed of her separation, and whatsoever she sitteth upon shall be unclean, as the uncleanness of a separation. And whosoever toucheth those things shall be unclean, and, and shall wash his clothes, and bathe himself in water, and shall be, un and be unclean until the evening. So, so, so on top of all that, she can't be around anybody. So on top of having this issue for 12 years, on top of spending all her money, on top of going to every doctor and getting worse, on top of missing Christ twice, she can't be around people. She's all by herself. Imagine that. Nobody. She can't get in the car for 12 years and go on a nice little date with her husband. She can't lay in the bed with her husband for 12 years. She can't participate in Thanksgiving meals for 12 years, no Christmas time. For 12 years, she can't hold the new grandbaby. For 12 years, she can't kiss her husband goodnight. I love you, honey. For 12 years, she can't do anything to be by her. She can't attend graduations and she can't attend church for 12 years. She's all by herself for 12 long years. She can't celebrate any anniversary between her and her husband. She's missed 12 years of her children's life for 12 years. No Christmas gifts for 12 years, y'all. No camp meetings, 12 years. Can't come and observe a baptism. 12 years. For 12 long years, she's all by herself. Now, it's bad enough if you're by yourself for a couple of months or, or a week or so. But for 12 long years, y'all, that'll make anybody go crazy. She can't call the pastor over and say, Pastor, I need you to pray with me. He said, Lady, you're unclean. I can't come in your vicinity. The elders can't come see her. The deacons can't come over. The deaconess can't. Can't take some songs over there and sing. Can't take communion for 12 long years. 12 long years. You can only imagine the psychological process she's going through. Maybe she thought about ending it all. I don't know. But 12 years is, is a long time. I can't even remember what I did 12 years ago. I'm 36. I can't be detailed. That's how long it's been. 
12 years ago, my son was three. He wasn't thinking about playing me in basketball. 12 years is a long time. I've been in ministry 14 years. 12 years. Going back to Mark chapter 5. This lady is desperate. On top of that, blood drains, takes away your energy. So it's not like she had a lot of energy on top of it. I have a friend who's anemic. I'll tell you the truth. If she don't take her iron pills, she's out for the count. No energy at all. Sleep most of the day. Twelve years. If we end the story there, there's no use of preaching. There's no use of encouraging anyone. Everybody would soon just want to give up. But thank God there's a Christ that knows how long my 12 years has been, that knows how many a long time I've had. Verse 27 says it this way. When she heard, had heard of Jesus. Come on now. Yeah. Ooh, we, I can. <laughs> See, there are just certain parts. Listen, you got to excuse me because there's things I just enjoy all by myself. See, see, there are times we read the Bible and we just read it like a novel. We read it like a book. But see, a preacher don't need much to start preaching on something. See, see, I get excited when it simply says when she had heard of Jesus. See, that right there takes me told to another plateau of understanding. When she had heard, didn't see him, she's missed him twice. She's been discouraged and she's been dismayed and she's been alone and, and she's perhaps been suicidal. But the Bible says when she had heard of Jesus, see, that right there is my wing in. That right there is the key to unlock the door. When she had heard Jesus, why? Because Romans 10 says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. See, she had heard, remember, Bartimaeus heard that Jesus was coming and he started crying out. See, sometimes you got to hear it. You may not see it. You can just hear it. Oh, it's easily said and done. See, sometimes when we hear about certain preachers going to be in the area, all we do is hear it and we flock there. Or, or, Or if you hear that it's a good party, You don't have to be there. You just heard about it, and you find yourself there. See, sometimes if you find out there's a good restaurant, you just hear it, and you find yourself there. See, I was told when I got here, I love Chinese food, even though I'm a black man. I was told that there's a good Chinese place in this place. I heard about it, went to it, went back today all by myself. Sometimes you just hear stuff. It'll it'll change your life. So this woman just heard that that Jesus was around. See, see, I don't know what, 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 what she heard, but here's what I do know. Whatever she heard perhaps prompted a sense of excitement. It, 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 it prompted her to do something different than what she did before. Maybe she heard in John chapter 2 that he turned water into wine. I don't know. Maybe she heard in Mark chapter 1 that Peter's mother-in-law was, her, was healed. I don't know what she heard. Maybe she heard that in John chapter 5 that he healed a man at a pool in Bethesda. I don't know. A gate. I don't know she, what she heard. But what I do know is that when she heard it, she moved. Maybe she heard in Mark chapter 1 that he healed the leper. I don't know. Maybe she heard that blind Bartimaeus himself was healed. I don't know. Maybe she heard in Mark chapter 2 that four brothers took their homeboy and, and tore the roof off the place and lowered him down, and he got up and started walking. I don't know. She heard something. I don't know. Maybe she heard in Luke 18 of the woman that was walking like this for 18 years. And when she she found out it was Jesus, and Jesus just said, woman, thou art loose, and she just started shaking it up and shaking it out and just walked straight. I don't know what she heard, but she heard something. Maybe she heard in Mark chapter 5 that he healed the demoniac. I don't know, but all I do know is that she heard something, and it's good enough for me. See, I heard that there's a Savior that can, that can save a wretch like me. So I start following this Savior. I went from Black Panther to Black Pastor, and I've been, I've been happy ever since. Are you with me so far? I just heard about this Savior. Sometimes all you got to do is hear it. 
You don't have to see it. You just got to hear what he can do. And that's enough for me. See, see, she heard. And I can imagine what she heard. She said, oh, shoot, I got one more chance at this thing. Why? Because three strikes, you're out. Whatever she heard, it prompted her to move on. And this is where the fight is in. See, see, I told you that, that God does not, listen to me now, God does not have any thoughts of us of evil but of peace. He wants to bring stuff in our life to a sense of peace. But he wants us to fight and give our all. And so now these scriptures are, 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 are kicking in. Verse 27 continues, says, when she had heard of Jesus, she, she came in the press behind, or she came in the crowd behind and, 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 and touched his garments. And for she said, listen to me now, for she said, if I may touch but his clothes, come on now, if I may touch but his clothes, not his body, if I may touch but his clothes, then, then I can be made whole. See, see, God understands, and, and, and this is how clear this thing is for me as I'm reading the Zion of Ages. And, and, and she says this, she says the Savior knew that he had a daughter who had an issue for 12 long years, and, and, and he started walking in her direction. See, see, Jairus thought that this thing is all about him, but he had a daughter who's been struggling for 12 years. See, Jairus had a daughter that was 12 years old that was about to die and sooner die, but Christ had a daughter also for 12 years that's been struggling, and, and so he said, I'm not going to let you strike out again. Amen. Hallelujah, somebody. I'm going to walk in your path. I'm going to slow myself down because I know that your energy has been lost because you've been bleeding for 12 years. So I'm going to move slow in this thing to make sure that this time you don't miss me. This time you won't be too late. This time I got you right where I want you. So he walked in her direction purposely. You need to understand something today that when Christ wants you, he's going to walk your way. He's not going to take a detour. He's not going to miss the turn. He's going to walk your way. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. But you can see her fighting this thing. She can, you can see her fighting. And listen, theologians believe that she wasn't uh, uh, standing up like us. They believe. And I'm on, I know I'm on TV. I wish I could crawl up in here. But they, they believe she was crawling. And you can imagine she's already embarrassed. And, I, and I'm not even talking about perhaps the smell. She's probably self-conscious of herself. She's probably self-conscious that, ah, it's too many folk. How am I going to get through? I don't have the energy to make it through. And she's crawling. You ever crawl in desperation and you just don't have the energy. And it's hard to put one foot above the next. And then to reach out. Ah, it takes a lot of energy. It's, it's not as simple as, it, as you may think, especially when you're tired. There are times I watch my mother slowly reach her hand out to me when I can just be like, boom. But my mother is like this at times. And it, it takes some energy. So I can imagine this woman on her knees struggling and not on concrete, like, but saying struggling. And she sees him in a distance and she's excited about it. But it just seems so far away. And all of a sudden, the Savior is right in her vicinity. And as he's in her vicinity, the Bible says, listen to me now, the Bible says, and straightway, verse 29, her fountain of blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the plague. She was healed of the plague. I, I, listen, I have such an imagination that I believe Brothers and sisters, that at the moment she touched but the hem of his garment, the moment she reached out and touched but the hem of his garment, that all of a sudden bath and body works just started floating in through her, and she had a cucumber melon smell about her. I don't know, but, but it was a smell that stood out like number four. You know how a woman just walks in the room, and you're like, and, and I, I'm not talking about you married, ma'am, because you can't do that, but, but, but you can imagine when a woman walks in the room, and you, oh, man, that, that was us. Uh, that smelled good. where she go now? Some of you married men probably do it, but you don't want to get caught doing it. I'm not telling you to do that, but you just better be careful. So, so I can imagine that all of a sudden now, all attention on her. Why? Because she has a smell like no one else. She has a presence like no one else. And the Bible says that instantly, not instantly, she was, she was healed. 
And why? Because God says, I want to give you a future and a hope. Somebody say amen out there. I want to give you a future and a hope. Why? Because I don't think anything evil of you, nothing of peace. I've watched you for 12 years. I've watched you struggle. I've watched you go through the pain, and I'm going to come at the right time, at the right moment. See, sometimes we think that God doesn't know what he's doing. But God always knows what he's doing. He understands timing better than we do. He understands timing. See, there are some of us that if he grabs us at the wrong time in our mind, we wouldn't be right. But he grabs us at the right time that both can come and meet and have each other. He crossed our path. At the right time. He could have crossed it at Capernaum. He could have crossed it at Levi Matthew House, but he crossed it at the right time. Because she was fighting the good fight of faith. She was given all she got. And her endurance lasted. Here's your question. All these people in the crowd again. How's it that one person gets healed? It's not about the crowd sometimes. It's about you and Jesus. You can't worry about what everybody else is doing. You have to worry about what you're doing. You have to understand that God calls at the right time. And sometimes, listen to me now, it's not enough to just call. For some of us, we have to reach out and grab. Sometimes you have to reach out and grab the Savior. And the Bible says, Jesus stopped immediately. Listen to me now. He stopped immediately and said, who touched me? And Peter being Peter said, Lord, you got everybody touch you. He's like, no, no, no. There's something different about this touch right here. There's something different about what's taking place. See, see, when your healing comes, God will stop instantly to recognize you. And he wanted to make sure that no superstition was there. He says, baby girl, I can imagine these baby girl, your, your faith has made the whole. See, we're here today because of foundations of our faith. See, all we need is a little bit of faith the size of a mustard seed. She says, if I would just reach out and touch the hem of his garment, not grab him, not come before him and say, yo, Jesus, help me. She said, I just want to touch a little bit of what you got, Lord. Don't take a whole lot. Don't take, don't take a theological study to come to Christ. It just takes a willingness mixed in with some faith and God can heal. So the Bible says that in Philippians 4, 19, that my God shall supply all my needs. Not some of my needs, but all of my needs. And sometimes, brothers and sisters, you have to reach out while believing to grab what you want. And so it goes back to that story of my mother. We were in the hospital and the doctors could not find what was going on. I said, Mama, now... It's the time, it's the acceptable time for you to reach out and grab God's hand with faith. And we start praying a different prayer. See, when the faith kicks in, you don't pray the same type of prayer. Oh, Lord, why we're here? Lord, why you got me? Why am I my mama here? We've been in church. We da, da, da. No, no, we praying, Lord, raise her up. Get up out of here. There's some doctors who don't believe that need to see. There's the there's great physician in the room. Why? Because we are told in the ministry of healing that when Jesus walked into the sick room, all diseases are, are gone. And so we start praying that prayer. We start reaching up so he can reach down and bring us up. And my mother walked out that hospital, and they couldn't figure out why she was there. Somebody say amen. They said, I don't even know why you're here, Mrs. Jackson. We, I don't know either. So, Mama, let's get up out of here. Sometimes you got to reach. You got to reach. You can't just call. Calling is good for some, but some of us got to reach. You got to reach. Reaching sometimes is not easy. It reminds me of a story. Two Native Americans, one was older, one was younger, and they were out fishing. And as they were out fishing, the older Native Americans started hearing cracking in the ice. And he told Junior, he said, Junior, come on this side. Junior's like, oh, old man, there's no cracking. You're hearing things. Your hearing is going bad. It's all right. The older Native American said, listen, I need you to jump right now. Don't wait because it could come quickly. Jump right now. Come on this side right now. He says, old man, I'm still a young spring chicken. 
If it starts cracking too quick, I'll just jump and it'll be all right. The older Native Americans, I need you to jump now. I need you to jump now. I need you to come on this side now. Young man again says, I got you, old man. All of a sudden, the, the ice cracked, and it starts splitting real fast, and it caught the, young, the younger by surprise, and it's, it's petrified him. He couldn't move. And the older one's saying, just jump. Come on, jump right now. Jump right now. Jump right now. Come on, jump right now. And he continued to just look petrified, and he couldn't move. And as the older Native American watched him go out into the sea, if he had only jumped, he would have been saved. Sometimes we have to do what's not comfortable for us, which may require a little jump, which may require a little reach. Sometimes we have to go outside and realize that if we really want change, then we have to reach becomes uncomfortable reach. We may be behind the crowd, but there's a healing for you. If you go a couple books over in in Mark, you'll see that this woman that Christ healed, all of a sudden now, wherever city Jesus went to, they started touching but the hem of his garment, and the Bible says that they became whole. Where do you think they got that from? From the woman. See, you have to understand that your healing is not just for you, but your healing is to help somebody else see Jesus and to know that that same Jesus can help them like he helped you. So it's never, it's never one way. It's always two way so that you can help somebody. So if you just decided you don't want to jump, then you may hurt somebody who needs to jump. So as we continue... We need you to jump today. We need you just to reach out. Just give it one more shot. Why? Because your healing is right there. Sometimes it's not enough to call. You just have to give it one more shot. And the Savior that I know will just walk in your direction nice and slow. Like he's strolling on a good Sabbath morning. Strolling. And he may even pause so you can reach back, touch him, and keep moving. Father in heaven, please help us to reach. Please help us to come to the point, Lord, where we can touch you in a special way. We thank you, Lord, for all you do. In his name, amen.